Good afternoon, everybody. And I'm hopeful that you're well. You ideally had some time to enjoy, do a little barbecuing and uh, take in the holiday weekend. And here we are in September, it's back to school and uh, that sense that summer is creeping to a close, but uh, it is uh, still, uh, I think, a, a time where uh, there's plenty to learn about and plenty to discuss, and we'll continue to bring these webinars to you on a weekly basis. I wanted to start by going through the agenda in terms of what we're going to be covering today. So if Kathy, you'd go to the next slide, please, I'll walk the audience through that. So I'm going to be covering as I typically do at the start of the programs I lead, um, going through the COVID latest as well as what we know about other relating public health uh, type matters. And I look forward then to uh, introducing Jeff Gleason, who is an attorney with us from our Buffalo office and who happens to know a lot about gambling in New York state. It's an exciting and ultimately emerging kind of field and there's a lot to learn here. Um, speaking of emerging fields, uh, Dustin Dorsino is back with us and out of our Syracuse office, he'll be telling us more about updates uh, in the cannabis industry where there has been uh, much that has transpired since Dustin was last with us um, earlier this year. I'll come back to you then uh, to cover some other healthcare updates that healthcare, uh, healthcare, excuse me, worker bonus program that we've talked a lot about and a few other odds and ends. And then we wanna, of course, as always, make sure there's time for your questions. So that's our plan for today. And with that, I'll get to it. So if Kathy, you could go to the next slide, please. Let me walk everybody through what's happening with regard to COVID. To begin, the good news is that we're seeing a continuing drop nationally, uh, another 13% drop um, in the 14 day uh, rates, uh, which is a trend that we have seen throughout the summer, essentially, after uh, what were much higher um, overall values across the country, uh, we've been finding our way downward. Notwithstanding, of course, we still have the issues with how we measure this all, um, but it does seem that there is uh, less in terms of caseload out there um, than there was even you know, a few weeks ago, which is good news. What we still don't know is what's going to happen in the fall. None of us can prognosticate, uh, certainly I can't anyway, and we're going to figure out um, together whether this fall will look different as we are more and more back to the ways uh, that we once were used to um, with for instance, kids back in school and uh, more people returning to their offices, et cetera, uh, that could have an effect on the kind of transmissibility we will be seeing in the coming months, but we just don't know yet. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. What you are seeing nationally is a continuing uh, diminishment in terms of those hot spots, which corresponds, of course, with that 13% drop I mentioned. Um, there's a real concentration in uh, states like Tennessee and uh, nearby, that uh, remains the case uh, as it was about two weeks ago. Elsewhere around the country, um, in the Midwest, we are seeing you know, some relative concentrations, but um, there is a set of lighter colors on the chart relative to darker colors, which is good news and we'll take it. So let's go to the next slide, please. If you focus on New York State, which of course uh, is important to many of you in our listening audience, um, we have seen far bigger drops. We are down about 40% over a two week period since I was last with you, which is great news and uh, certainly we will take it. Um, and so what we haven't seen though are active uh, changes when it comes to the regulatory structure. To the contrary, we're seeing a broader relaxation around them. Um, while there are recommendations still in place around masking while dining indoors, for instance, um, you know, that is uh, not at all a requirement. And uh, we're also seeing the CDC loosening isolation uh, recommendations when it comes to COVID exposures. So we're getting into this place nationally where, as I've mentioned before, we're all learning to live with the virus. And uh, so it is good news that in New York, the numbers are suggestive of that kind of approach being, uh, at least for the moment, a prudent one. So let's go to the next slide, please. 
So here, as we typically do, I uh, like to focus on some of the counties uh, where we are seeing uh, COVID popping up or not. And uh, we're more in the or not camp this week, uh, if you look at the September 6 data. Um, yes, Broome County has gone up a bit, um, but small numbers there relatively uh, in terms of what's being measured. Um, in most other places, you're seeing um, big drops, which is consistent with that 39% overall, which is again, good news. Next slide, please. Another biggie, if you will, that came out during the time when I was last with you and today. Um, last week, uh, we received federal endorsement for uh, the bivalent vaccine uh, boosters, which are targeting the Omicron subvariants. Um, as someone who got one of them this summer, I can tell you they're not terribly fun. And so, um, you know, glad to hear that the um, vaccines are being tweaked in order to account for that reality. Um, in specific, Moderna is available for all adults and Pfizer uh, for those 12 and older. And so um, we will see that distribution network uh, getting on its way very shortly. New York State is in the process of essentially uh, getting the doses out where they uh, will be, whether in pharmacies or um, other uh, locales. And it's also the case that in other places around the country, people are already getting shots, including in Florida. So um, more to come on that, I'm sure, as we move into the fall. We're also going to be, of course, tracking how the traditional flu overlays with all of this, because as more people are um, in uh, closed spaces without masks, as you know, it all used to be, if you will, um, we can expect we'll be seeing flu transmission and we'll be tracking that too. Next slide, please. So monkeypox, which is one that you know, has emerged over the course of these uh, summer months, it is still, knock on wood, under some good control uh, in terms of you know, what the overall strategy is, which is to avoid an endemic uh, kind of relationship where it's something that we all live with in the United States that has not been the case. Um, the vaccine uh, is still... Uh, you know, being rolled out with some of the supply chain issues that I've mentioned previously. And there is now um, an approved approach essentially to split those vaccine doses among five and uh, to provide the dosing in a way that uh, makes that vaccine efficacious, efficacious excuse me, nonetheless. Um, what we also know is that this is at its root a small, or, yeah, smallpox vaccine that is being um, adapted for use against monkeypox. It has been successful in certain uh, other uh, settings, including animals, but it has not uh, been, you know, as much as humans are concerned, uh, tested with the kind of volume that, you know, gives us an absolute certitude that this will all work. But there is a lot of optimism around uh, the efficacy uh, we're seeing thus far. And, uh, public health officials are very much geared up to make sure that um, shots are getting where they need to. And uh, as I mentioned in the last webinar, that there's also public health messaging around this, including um, high schoolers heading back to school and uh, other types of settings where it's important to just have the awareness around uh, this emerging public health trend. Next slide, please. And on polio, which I've talked about before, again, we're seeing it in the wastewater, it's still out there in uh, downstate New York counties, particularly in the Hudson Valley. And we have reason to believe it's um, elsewhere, but we also know that um, vaccines really work um, with polio. And uh, for a very long time, that has been a way of uh, controlling its spread in the United States to levels that you know were at you know, functional eradication. We're not there right now, uh, of course, but um, New York State is very much on top of tracking this issue too. Um, and so we'll keep you apprised as it may affect all of you. Next slide, please. So that covers what I was intending to get to in my opening remarks. And I'll be back with you, as I mentioned. But for now, I'd love to cede the floor to Jeff Gleason, who's with us from Buffalo. He's a senior counsel like I am. And uh, he is someone who has uh, done a variety of interesting things in his career, including um, working as an assistant general counsel for one of the world's largest privately held companies, um, a Buffalo-based global hospitality company, 
um, in charge of its gaming and entertainment division, which is, of course, quite germane for what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and before that, and uh, of course, before joining Bond, Jeff was a corporate and transactional attorney um, in private practice uh, based in Buffalo as well as in Boston. So uh, Jeff brings a lot of uh, well-rounded experience to us and uh, is going to be, as we get ready for NFL season and other sports that people might be following, uh, is going to help us understand what's going on with gambling in New York and what we should know, particularly for those who wish to engage in it in new and different ways. So. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Gabe. So, uh, as as Gabe said, we you know we're, we're we're heading out of summer and into fall, and one of the most exciting parts of, of that is the start of the NFL season, and right around the corner is the the World Series and the starts of uh, the NHL and NBA seasons. Uh, so we think we figured we'd uh, provide an update on 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 two things uh, relative to to gambling in New York State. Uh, the first uh, being sports betting. Uh, Kathy, if you can proceed to the next slide. Uh, so, so I wanted to give an update on where we stand with sports betting. If, if you'll recall, uh, mobile sports betting launched in New York State on January 8th of this year. Uh, so we're just under nine months of, of that being operational in New York. Uh, we started with, with four operators uh, at launch being approved. Uh, by February, that number was seven. And then we had uh, another operator join the field in, in March of 2022. And the last approved operator by the Gaming Commission uh, went live in July of this year. So you know, we, we have nine uh, mobile operators uh, accepting sports bets in, in New York right now. That's in addition to what was the existing 11 retail uh, uh, locations in New York, uh, retail sports books uh, being at the commercial casinos as well as uh, tribal gaming outlets. Um, and since that time, in, the, in that nine months, uh, we've had over $10 billion wagered in New York, which, which is, is a huge number in such a short period of time. Uh, New York State has also collected over $390 million in taxes on those gaming revenues. Um, that number uh, has long since passed uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania as the most taxes collected on mobile sports betting by any state in the US. And that's that's pretty impressive for New York, considering, you know, again, we've only been live here in this state for nine months. Uh, PASPA was overturned in 2018, and that's when New Jersey went live, Pennsylvania not long after that. Uh, so to, to, to have that much tax revenue generated in such a short period of time is, is pretty impressive. Um, that also is without the benefit of a full NFL season. Uh, NFL is, is one of the most popular sports on which to bet. And with the season starting uh, on, on Thursday of this week, uh, and the Buffalo Bills being the Super Bowl favorite across most of the sports books in the U.S., uh, I think we can we can anticipate a, a large growth in, in gaming handle as well as the taxes that are collected um, from the revenues uh, 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 on, on, on those bets. Uh, so go Bills! Um, next slide, please. Something a little more newish, um, I'd say, uh, would be the the expansion of casino gaming in, in New York. Um, so in 2013, if you'll recall, New York uh, uh, passed by constitutional amendment a a uh, expansion to the gaming that is that is permitted in the state, and that authorized up to seven full scale commercial casinos in various regions of of the state. Uh, however, at the time that the implementing legislation was passed, the Substate New York Gaming Economic Development Act, um, a, 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 a somewhat of a deal was struck that, uh, you know, at first, in order to help some of the, uh, you know, economically disadvantaged regions of upstate New York, they would allow for four licenses in those regions upstate to uh, be issued initially and get up and running and then uh, three downstate casino licenses would kind of be held back. And, and those licenses would not be issued at least for the first seven years following the first issuance of a license for an upstate facility. And in this context, downstate really means these counties that are listed on the slide, the counties of Putnam, Rockland, Westchester, Bronx, New York, Richmond, Kings, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. So uh, New York City, the, the regions north of New York City and Long Island are, are really kind of the, the, the areas that um, were, were forbidden, uh, for lack of a better term, from opening a, a, a casino during this time. However, uh, in this past April, when Governor Hochul signed the 2023 budget bill, uh, 
a provision in that bill accelerates the timeline for the issuing of these three downstate casino licenses. And that's kind of where we are right now. Um, next slide, please. So what does this mean? So right now, uh, the just like in 2013, uh, the Gaming Commission is, is set to fill a gaming, uh, I'm sorry, a gambling facility location board. And that board has to be in place per the legislation by October 6th of this year. After that time, uh, the Gambling Facility Location Board has 90 days to issue a request for applications for potential casino operators. And from that point, uh, we're off to the races, so to speak. Um, so the applications will have to be submitted and reviewed by the Gaming Facility Location Board. Um, for anybody who might be concerned about uh, you know, having a casino in, in their neighborhood or in their region, um, the law does provide that the Gambling Facility Location Board has to consult with community advisory committees that are to be set up within these proposed uh, regions uh, for, for casino applicants. Um, so the casino, or I'm sorry, the community advisory committees almost have a veto, right, on, on some of these applications because the community advisory committees must approve by a two thirds vote of, of a proposed uh, casino location uh, or a casino applicant. And then the uh, Gaming Facility Location Board will make recommendations to the full Gaming Commission and the Gaming Commission will then vote on the applicants to be awarded uh, one of these three licenses for the downstate casinos. Next slide, please. So really the, the, the timeline for, for actually uh, having a downstate casino may seem long, but it could actually be shorter than, than expected. And the reason for that is there are a, a couple locations in, in these downstate counties that are uh, primed for potential uh, full-scale casinos and that are often considered to be favorites for the issuance of one of these casino licenses. And those two locations are the, the Empire City uh, at Yonkers Raceway, which is operated by MGM, and Resorts World at the, at the Aqueduct Racetrack in Queens. And part of the reason why they're considered to be favorites or, or, or you know, kind of possible locations for these casinos is that they, they currently operate what we typically refer to as racinos or, or class two gaming facilities at these racetracks downstate. Um, there is existing infrastructure there, obviously. They are currently licensed, although in a different capacity with the Gaming Commission. And there's, you know, there, there's existing investments in those communities that should be given some weight, at least, uh, to, to uh, determine whether they're going to actually be issued a full-scale casino license. Um, however, there are other locations that have been proposed or at least are, you know, are being cited by, by industry experts. Uh, Steve Cohen has been proposing a potential casino next to City Field where the Mets play. Uh, Coney Island's been suggested, Belmont Park, uh, along the East River and locations like Kipps Bay. And even there's been some talk about a potential casino in Times Square or above Saks Fifth Avenue in Midtown. Um, those would certainly uh, require a, a, a substantial uh, redevelopment of property, uh, but, but it would uh, you know, certainly be an, an exciting uh, location for, for one of these facilities. So really, you know, what, is, what does this mean if you don't have uh, you know, a huge swath of land in, in a downstate county and $500 million for one of these initial license fees? Um, for, for a lot of these potential applicants, you know, I noted the community advisory committees that'll have to be consulted about these locations. Um, the Gambling Facility Location Board also must consider uh, in the application process whether the applicant's going to provide the highest number of quality jobs. There are also concerns about uh, potential casinos uh, vulturing business from local hotels and, and restaurants, which you know, are two amenities that are typically associated with casinos. And so partnerships with local governments and these kind of businesses are something that the Gambling Facility Location Board is going to analyze when they're determining whether to issue one of these licenses. The applicants must also demonstrate a utilization of substantial or sorry, sustainable development practices and an implementation of well-rounded workforce development plans. So these are also kind of concerns on the legal end of things that uh, either a potential applicant uh, will, will, will need to think about or will need to partner with, uh, with a business or, or uh, you know, attorney or, or consultant on, on working those plans into their application. Next slide, please. 
And then just briefly, you know, I want to touch on a couple of things of, of, of what could be next uh, for, for New York gambling. Uh, the first is iGaming. Uh, iGaming is, is online, full-scale casino gambling, um, you know, wagering real money, not just, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the casino apps that are associated with Facebook. Um, and iGaming, you know, shortly after launch of sports betting, iGaming was one of the first things to make its way into a bill introduced into the legislature. Um, it did not get passed out of committee, but certainly there are legislators that are focused on, on this being kind of the next step of, of expanding gaming in New York State. There's also a lot of uh, talk about certain adjustments to the existing mobile sports betting infrastructure. Those things could involve the lowering of the tax rate. Uh, right now it's 51%, but a lot of people are focused on whether we can increase the number of operators and decrease the, the tax rate to make it more profitable for the operators and also uh, you know, uh, provide for a better experience for the, the, the consumer. Um, additional uh, um, adjustments that could be made are expanding in the number of what we call sports betting markets uh, that are permitted by the operators. These involve you know, potential uh, uh, removal of the ban on in-state collegiate betting or uh, you know, simply just adding things like being able to bet on who the MVP is going to be of the NFL or who's gonna win the Heisman Trophy, who's gonna be the first pick in the NBA draft. All of these bets are currently unavailable in New York. Um, there's also a focus on potentially adding uh, kiosk betting to stadiums in New York. Uh, one of the um, uh, operators that was approved in the sports betting process uh, uh, did partner or has partnerships with the various uh, sports teams, professional sports teams in New York, and I think they'd really like to, to see that be one of the things that, that is expanded. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, this is kind of a little bit farther out, but uh, there has been some rumblings about potential expansion into uh, fixed odds horse racing uh, with Saratoga Racetrack, Belmont Park, and Aqueduct here in New York. Um, New York is, 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 is a focal point for potential expansion of, of how to uh, bring back horse racing and, and, and betting on horses. Um, Monmouth Park in New Jersey has started an experiment with fixed odds horse racing, and uh, it, it is looking certainly to, uh, to partner with other states and, and, and potentially make a move away from paramutual racing to, to fixed odds horse racing. So with that, uh, you know, that those are those are the updates on on gambling in New York. Um, I'll I'll turn it back to to to, to Gabe to introduce Dustin, and uh, you know we'll see um, what, what what's next up in in cannabis. Fantastic, Jeff. Thank you so much for those updates. Um, I was interested, among other uh, aspects of your presentation, in noting that City Field may be a site. Uh, I'm a Mets fan, as I've disclosed before, and uh, that could be interesting. Let alone Kips Bay, which is uh, where our Manhattan offices are based, uh, it would be a fascinating change to uh, how uh, our neighborhood looks uh, near those bond offices. And uh, you know, we'll be tracking these developments closely. Um, there may have been one or two questions, Jeff, that came in through the chat. So uh, please take a look at those if you can. And um, now I will introduce Dustin, uh, who is with us again. We're really glad to have Dustin back. And as a reminder, Dustin uh, sits in Syracuse and uh, he was uh, also before Bond uh, did his uh, legal training uh, or, or rather his legal study at uh, Syracuse University College of Law and uh, among other accolades was an executive editor for the Syracuse Law Review. Um, and he focuses on a wide array of issues for Bond clients, but has really uh, been in particular looking closely at the cannabis industry, its growth and its new dimensions, which are ones that are changing by the minute. And so with that, Dustin, love to hear what's new. And I will certainly be waiting with my own questions after your presentation, but for now, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gabe. And uh, for, for everyone listening, uh, I, I was on previously to talk about the marketing and advertising regulations that uh, have since been revised in New York State. But today's presentation that I have for all of you is about what not to do in uh, the cannabis, the emerging cannabis market in New York State, uh, particularly as it comes to gifting cannabis. 
Um, so Kathy, if you would like to go to the next slide, please. Um, before I before I start into the specifics of what gifting cannabis means and has meant in New York State, I wanted to provide some background as the current uh, cannabis regu regulatory landscape has been changing every day in New York State. So on the recreational side of things, uh, previously licensed hemp growers and processors were able to get uh, conditional cannabis cultivation and processing licenses uh, all the way up till the end of last month. And the Cannabis Control Board recently approved hundreds of applications for previous hemp growers to cultivate and process cannabis. And those sales are likely going to start at the, the end of this year or the, the very beginning of 2023 to the general public of New York State. Uh, also on the recreational side of things, uh, New York State has yet to release regulations that will allow dispensaries to sell cannabis to the general public other than the conditional retail dispensary regulations, which are only open to uh, the so-called social and economic uh, justice applicants, which include uh, those people that were adversely affected by the war on drugs in the past or own minority or um, women-owned business enterprises or are disabled veterans. Um, and those, those applications are currently up and available on the state's website and the application period closes later this month. On the medical side of things, uh, you're still not able to grow your own medical cannabis at home. So for those of you that have 50 cannabis plants in your basement, you might want to think about a better way to hide those. But the public comment period uh, recently closed in July and uh, revised regulations have been posted on the state's website but have not yet been finalized. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. So. Uh, we've been getting a lot of questions from our cannabis clients, and uh, one of the main ones has been, can I share it with my friends? Uh, on the, the medical side of things, uh, as the regulations are not finalized yet, the answer is no. But when regulations are finalized, certified patients and caregivers are going to be able to transfer up to three ounces to other patients or caregivers. And uh, the proposed regulations uh, talk about who may be a certified patient or who, who is authorized to go see their doctor to get a medical cannabis card. And that includes people with uh, specific types of uh, medical conditions, including Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, ALS, uh, PTSD, and um, any other condition at the discretion of a certified doctor. Um, so patients still cannot grow their own medical cannabis, but shortly they will be able to get medical cannabis from their doctor, um, from their certified doctors, and then they will be able to grow up to three mature or immature plants at the same time once the revised regulations become finalized. On the recreational side of things, um, New York State, as I said previously, has not authorized the recreational sale in dispensaries yet. Um, the regulations have not have not even yet been posted to the state's website. So in order to get around this fact, many businesses have been taking to gifting cannabis uh, as a way to get around the lack of regulation yet in New York State. And what gifting cannabis means is that um, dispensaries or pop-up tents would sell consumers an unrelated non-cannabis product, such as a t-shirt or a golf club membership or sneakers or a koozie. And inside, wrapped around the koozie or t-shirt would be uh, cannabis or gummies or tinctures or other cannabis products. And 
they would justify this by saying that the, the money was switching hands because of the unrelated products that the customer was actually buying the t-shirt or the koozie and the weed was just a free gift. Well, New York State, uh, specifically the Office of Cannabis Management, has since come out and said that that is a no-no. Um, it recently sent out dozens of cease and desist letters to these pop-up gifting storefronts in the past month that have demanded this practice and other similar ones stop. Uh, or else these businesses would be subject to potential criminal and monetary penalties in addition to losing their eligibility to apply for New York State's new licenses when these application periods open up in the coming weeks and months. Uh, next slide, please, Kathy. Uh, next slide. So if you are gifting cannabis, Perhaps you're setting up a roadside tent, uh, selling t-shirts to the general public and throwing a couple gummies inside for free. Um, it would be wise to stop doing that immediately so you don't face potential monetary or criminal penalties. And you're still eligible to apply for those New York State licenses when, they, uh, when the application periods open up. Uh, in order to start getting ready to apply for those application periods, it would be wise to look on the uh, Office of Cannabis Management's website at the, the mock-ups of the applications that are open or have been open in the past. Uh, for example, the cannabis uh, conditional cultivator and processor applications have since closed, but the mock-up of the applications are still up on the website. And while the retail dispensary licenses are, are likely to contain some different requirements than those past applications, uh, many of the same uh, informational uh, requirements are likely to be similar from license to license. So that is one way to help get you started to the, the legal sale of cannabis in New York State and get your applications ready for those licenses. Additionally, if you are interested in starting a, a retail cannabis operation in New York State or, or any other licensed cannabis business, uh, it's definitely a good idea to talk to uh, your accountant to determine how, how you're going to properly finance these. Um, past applications have had fees ranging from a couple thousand dollars to a couple hundred thousand dollars just for the application fee before buying any equipment or complying with any security regulations or hiring employees or any of that. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about uh, 280E and uh, the New York State's recent change from federal tax law to now allowing deductions for cost of goods sold. Um, and that, that's definitely something that you'd want to bring up with your accountant as well. Um, so that the cannabis market can definitely be a, a lucrative and valuable uh, venture to get into, but it's it's definitely important for those interested to understand the costs before venturing out into this emerging market. Um, next slide, please, Kathy. Um, and so if, if anyone has any, any questions at all about gifting or any other cannabis-related questions, you can feel free to uh, send your questions in the chat, or you can reach out to me uh, via email or uh, telephone. Thank you. Hey, well, thanks, everybody. And I'm going to uh, take over here and uh, share my uh, slides with you. So bear with me while I do that. Um, and are you seeing those slides, everybody? Great. So um, here's what I want to do. I want to just make sure that we walk through uh, some of the changes to the healthcare um, worker bonus program. This is, of course, a program that all of you have been uh, following through our webinar updates. Um, the first deadline was uh, September 2nd, which was Friday um, of last week. That deadline was 
at some level extended uh, into October. Essentially, if you follow the uh, FAQs and the other uh, relating presentation information from the Department of Health, um, employers must be able to show good faith efforts that they sought to comply with the September 2nd deadline, uh, which we've been advising many of you about um, you know, in our uh, conversations offline. Um, but you know, for those who uh, weren't able to get everything uh, completed due to some of the emerging questions and issues, uh, the state did grant more time, which is good news. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to just spend a moment on is well go through some of the FAQ updates that we saw based on a uh, word that came out on August 31st. Um, I remind all of you that the FAQs um, were uh, updated a couple times previously. Um, one thing that was ambiguous was um, essentially the nature of contracted staff and their engagement with uh, the program. And now what we know is that, you know, from the state's viewpoint, temporary staffing is uh, essentially not part of the program, it, in, even if there is a contracted relationship, which affects staffing agencies providing temporary staffing support. Um, I've pulled the Q&A from uh, the FAQ uh, specifically concerning this. Um, that is actually, I think, going to affect a number of organizations as they work with their staffing agencies um, around uh, who is in and who is out as far as employees are concerned in this program. So please uh, pay heed to that. And then there are some other updates that I'll highlight for you. Um, first, um, when we're looking at uh, employment, it's generally to be deemed continuous, even if someone moves from employer to employer within a recognized health system. Uh, there were some questions, for instance, around um, you know, whether uh, moving from one uh, you know, employer site to another within a health system essentially restarted the clock and changed eligibility. The state, um, with some technical guidance around the same, which we can talk with you about offline, essentially says no if it's within a system type setting. Um, the state has also looked uh, at the $125,000 annual cap and clarified some elements around um, you know, what per diem uh, rates mean relative to that, um, as well as overall amounts earned. The short answer is the cap is uh, $125,000, no matter how you get there with some exceptions. Um, and so that is broadly what the guidance um, outlines. And then it also uh, does specify that within uh, different vesting periods of six months, um, essentially half that amount is the target goal. And uh, there are some more technical elements of guidance around how to calculate eligibility in that spirit. We'll continue to update on this program, which is one we know that many of you are engaged with. And uh, the questions that we've been receiving uh, suggest that you um, are interested in learning more and we'll continue to provide it. So thank you. Um, here are some resources that I want to remind all of you about, um, including uh, the Department of Health's uh, website and uh, the FAQ, uh, which you can refer to uh, freely as you see fit. So, um, but again, I'm here as well as uh, many colleagues in the health and long-term care practices uh, conversant in this program. So um, please reach out if you have questions. The uh, vesting periods, as I mentioned, are um, five in total. And the first one was officially closed as of September 2nd. Um, but there will be an allowance for filing of essentially the first vesting period matters uh, within the second vesting period as a mode of you know, functional cleanup uh, as this program rolls out. And so let me also then just shift to home health minimum wage. Um, and here, what I wanted to highlight is that um, the program uh, is set to unfurl, if you will, as of October 1. You may recall that during the budget, there were uh, extensive negotiations uh, going back to our spring around essentially um, you know, how home health workers uh, were and were not compensated um, you know, via the Medicaid program. Um, there are uh, essentially elevated rates that are being folded in. There's a webinar about uh, how that's getting done uh, that New York State will be leading on the 12th, which is next week, uh, from one to two. So if you have questions around how to register, you can reach out uh, to us and we can help you out. Um, next, uh, noting that um, you know, we want to get through to ensure we have time for your questions. 
Um, the License Home Care Services Agency um, licensure application process was reopened. This is a big thing for those uh, who um, live in that uh, home care space involving uh, Medicaid and some non-medical services. Um, it applies to all applications for licensure submitted on or after April 1st of 2020. Um, and essentially it clarifies a pathway um, around ownership changes, which had been by and large on hold um, as a consequence of the pandemic, um, which itself uh, extended uh, what were uh, essentially, uh, you know, guidance or what was guidance by the Department of Health for a two-year moratorium on additional licensure. Um, and so that ended up becoming something closer to four years, but now that gatekeeping has been removed and we're going to see um, a new process that is outlined within the Dear Administrator, Administrator letter, excuse me, um, that I depict here, but that uh, certainly we can make sure you have an opportunity to review further if you're so interested. Um, there will be uh, character and uh, competency reviews uh, inherent in uh, this new licensure process as well as a or I should say reopened as much as anything and rebuttable presumption of no need based on geographic saturation, generally um, five functioning LICSAs in given geographies. So next slide. Um, it's important also to just make sure you're aware that um, for applications involving um, less than or fewer than uh, 25 patients, um, uh, excuse me, let me just rephrase that. Um, if they're actively serving at least 25 patients, they will not be subject to public need review and only be evaluated uh, based on financial feasibility. Uh, as you can see here, this is pulled from the Dear Administrator letter. And then um, there are various carve outs of uh, categories that are essentially not going to be subject to this process. Um, Looks as affiliated with assisted living programs, for instance, or PACE programs, et cetera they'll be exempt um, from this public need methodology. So um, if you have questions, that's the DOH email address at the bottom of the slide. We are certainly happy to answer your questions generally. And let me stop my share now. And if Kathy, um, you could just let us know um, if we've received any questions, I'm gonna take a quick look myself as well at the chat. Um, and so let's go to the last slide, please, Kathy, if you would, of the deck that you have. Um, I would appreciate that. And um, so a question that I'm seeing is uh, essentially around Medicaid and non-Medicaid providers and the bonus program. We are happy to answer that offline. Um, and so I will reach out to the questioner um, around that as well. There's another questioner who has questions around um, the registration information for the webinar on the 12th, we'll make sure to furnish that to those interested. And then finally, for those who had questions around uh, the healthcare bonus for schools, education broadly remains carved out of the healthcare worker bonus program. For now, it will be rolled in in October. That hasn't changed. We're going to learn more about that when we get additional guidance. Um, so with that, I've uh, responded, I think, to all of the open questions that we've had or otherwise have pledged to do so offline. I want to thank all of you for making the time to be with us as you do every uh, Tuesday at noon. Adam will be your host next Tuesday, and then I'll be back in two weeks. And in the interim, we thank you for tuning in. And please do come to us with whatever questions we may be able to answer you. For now, have a good afternoon and uh, a good start to what feels like fall and otherwise uh, stay safe out there. Thank you.